Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to those who are joining us on oh, got a bit of feedback on the live stream. Um, as we often find, unfortunately, in the evenings, people tend to come in, but they tend to be a little bit late. So we're going to get on worshiping the Lord wholeheartedly. So if you are able, would you please stand? And then I'm going to open in prayer and hand over to our amazing worship team so that we can just devote ourselves to the Lord in some worship. So, Lord, we come before you in various states from being really content to having issues that we're dealing with in strife. But I thank you, Lord, that regardless of how we come to worship you tonight, you are constant. You are faithful. You are full of grace. You are hope itself. And I thank you, Lord, that you make it really clear in Scripture that when two or three are gathered in your name, you are there present. And so we welcome you, Lord Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Heavenly Father. And we devote ourselves to worshipping you, to lifting our eyes above whatever we're experiencing, to focus solely on you. And so I encourage you to do that now, to just begin to pour out your own prayers of praise and worship. Whatever it is you need to do to focus on Jesus, so fix your eyes on him, that you might run the race with perseverance. Fix your eyes on him. Pour out your praise. Begin to speak it out. And then we join in with the band as they lead us on. Oh, 
preparing for tonight, um, I really felt like we should sing this chorus over our own lives. We all have situations where we need Jesus' power and Jesus' healing and for Jesus to bring life. Um, so just bring to mind now situations in your life, in the lives of other people, um, where you need to see those things, where you need to see the power of Jesus, where you need freedom, where you need hope. Um, and let's just ask him to bring that and to um, bring us freedom. Um, so we're just going to sing... We need your power, we need your healing.
Time enough. 
to hail Jesus as Lord, we are going to um, eat bread and drink wine. The meals that he gave us that declares his victory, the fact that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Please do feel free to take your seats. And would you join me with the words in bold type? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And as we come to receive bread and wine, we come with all that we have and all that we are. And so at this point, we just want to pause to think about our offering, our, our mini offering. Um, we give willingly all that we have and all that we are. So some of us give directly through our bank accounts. Some of us use the cash machine um, or the cash box at the back. But whatever way we give, we do so together. So we say together our offertory prayer. Lord, the giver of life and salvation, in gratitude we bring to the altar all that we have and all that we are. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in this place, our city, and beyond. Amen. And we say together the prayer our Saviour taught us. And I encourage you to say this in the language of your preference. If English is not your first language, then we'd encourage you to use your first language. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread is gluten-free. And at the stations, um, there will be alcoholic wine. If you prefer non-alcoholic wine, then please go to the station in the middle for the person serving there. If you would like to come for just a blessing, then please indicate that by simply keeping your hands at your side. And the stewards will tell you when to come forward. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. If those who are serving would like to come forward.
We're now going to have our reading. Um, Joey, if you'd like to come forward, and then Jitesh is going to come speak to us. Tonight's reading is from Jude 1 to 4. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a silence for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Joey, thanks for bringing that uh, very short reading. With those of you who might be visiting or new, uh, my name's Jitesh, one of the uh, team here at Holy Trinity Leicester, and it's a great joy to be kicking off a short mini-series, really, a three-part series in this letter, the letter of Jude, that Joey's just read the first part of. Uh, before we dig in, can I, can I invite you to pray with me? It'd be such an encouragement if you'd pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it means that we're not left in the dark as to who you are. Thank you that you revealed yourself in Jesus Christ, the word, inscribed in the scriptures, your word, and that you speak your word to us today by your spirit. And we pray, Lord, come by your spirit. Speak to us. Enliven us. Give us new life through your word, we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know how well you know the letter of Jude. It's, it's actually uh, often overlooked. It's the penultimate letter of the New Testament, the last but one. You suddenly hit Revelation, and that's a lot more big and exciting and full of crazy imagery, and often Jude is passed over. It's actually one of the shortest letters in the New Testament, one of the shortest books in the whole Bible, in fact. But I love Jude, and I love it because it's really surprising. It doesn't do what you expect it to do. It doesn't say what you expect it to say. Uh, we know from verse 1 that Jude is the younger brother of Jesus, though he doesn't say that explicitly. He says something else. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. He doesn't call himself Jesus' brother. He actually calls himself Jesus' servant and James's brother. But who is James? Well, the only James that could have been named like that without further reference, it's the only James well known enough in the early church would have been the Apostle James, one of the early church leaders in Jerusalem. And he was, we know, one of Jesus' younger brothers. And in fact, to be specific, one of his younger half-brothers, because of course Jesus didn't have a human father. And so what's Jude saying? He's saying, Jude... Brother of James, who is the brother of Jesus. What's he saying by implication? Actually, I am one of Jesus' younger brothers. And I find this fascinating right from the beginning because he's, he could have called himself Jude, the brother of Jesus. But actually, he's had such an encounter with Jesus that he can't bring himself to say that. And all he can bring himself to say is that he is the Lord and I am his servant. I once knew him as my older brother, but now I know him as Lord, and I've given my life over completely to be his servant. And I wonder what that must have been like for him. We know from the biblical accounts that Jude would have been in that household, growing up with Jesus amongst uh, the whole family. And in Jesus' earthly ministry, he was amongst the family that thought Jesus had lost it. At one point, they go to rebuke Jesus because they think he's lost the plot, he's become unhinged. And he goes from that complete misrecognition of who Jesus is as his older brother to worshipping him and serving him as Lord. A complete turnaround. He's been saved and turned 180 degrees away from where he was before and towards 
seeing Jesus clearly as the Messiah that they'd been waiting for, the Lord. What must have that been like? What must have it been like to know that your older brother, who actually you, you knew in your teenage years, you knew as the older brother, who perhaps you, you actually didn't really like very much because younger brothers don't always like older brothers, perhaps. And then suddenly realising, oh, I've got it wrong. He's the Lord. No, long, no wonder he never did anything wrong. <laughs> He's the Messiah. And part of me expects Jude to want to write about this com- complete change that he's experienced, this amazing turnaround, this salvation, this recognition of who Jesus is, this 180-degree turn. And that's what he wants to do, but he doesn't. Instead, he writes a letter that's very different. Let me read verse 3 for us. He says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Jude wanted to write one letter, but he had to write another. He wanted to write about their common salvation. Yes, about how he'd experienced the salvation of Jesus, how they'd experienced it, and to glory in that, and to revel in it, and to expound its riches and its depths and its glory. He wanted to write that letter. But he said, I have to write another letter to you. And this letter is completely different. That those things that I would have explained and gloried in in the letter that I wanted to write actually are coming under attack. And the letter I'm writing to you has got a simple charge, and that is to contend for these things, to fight for them, to defend them, to hold your ground and to hold them and to guard them. Now, part of me, I admit, wishes we had this other letter, the one that he wanted to write. I wonder what that would have been like. I wonder what it would have said. We don't know. But instead, we've got this letter right in front of us. And this letter is very different. It's a letter of fire. It's a letter of warning. It's a letter that causes us to sit up and pay attention and ask what's going on in our church and our churches and what's going on in the world. It's a letter that very simply says to contend, to contend for the faith that was once more delivered to God's holy people, to contend for what we believe in. And that word contend in verse 3 actually in the Greek is, was commonly used of athletes, contending in competition, but even more prevalently, it was used of soldiers fighting in war. It's that kind of language that Jude is using in this letter. What the Ukrainian soldiers right now, even tonight, are doing in the Ukraine, contending for their land, holding the ground, fighting for it. He's saying that is what you need to do with your faith. That is what you need to do to hold it You need to guard it. You're going to need to fight for it. It's that important. You need to, as it were, set a circle of fire around it and set it to blaze and defend it to the hilt. And it sounds shocking. It sounds strong, doesn't it? He's saying something really powerful and he wants us to hear clearly what he's saying. And it might be shocking to our ears, but he gives two really good reasons to to why he's saying this. This other letter, this other message he thinks is more urgent. And I think that the reasons that we're to take him seriously and we're to gain that same desire to contend for the faith. And the first reason he gives from this, this beginning of the letter is that we're to contend for our faith because our faith is treasure, that it's special, that actually it's worth contending for, it's worth fighting for, that God has entrusted a faith to us, and it's not just to us, but for future generations as well that is special. Jude describes it as the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Later he calls it their most holy faith at the end of the letter. Here he says it's the faith, not just any old faith, not just a a version of the faith, but the faith, the only one that matters. The revelation of Christ, the way of salvation, the truth about God, 
the universe and everything that matters, but into our hands to guard and to keep and to steward and defend. My own testimony is that I came to Christ out of an atheistic background studying physics at Oxford. And one of the reasons I was studying physics, God bless the physicists, by the way, if there's any here, is that I was searching for all, I think, all, I was asking all the right questions, but I was searching for it in the wrong places. I thought that by understanding the scientific description as to why the universe is what it is, I'd, I'd get the answers to the deepest questions about why the universe exists, where it's heading, what, what holds it together, what's my place in it. I was asking the right questions, but looking in the wrong places. And when I met Jesus, I realized, oh, he's the place for those answers. That what he says about the universe is the truth about it. What he says about my life in this universe is the truth about my life. What he says about the future of all things is the truth about the future. Infinitely more precious and valuable than all the equations that I'd learned and recited by heart. And if you've come to know Jesus, you've come to know what he said about you and your place in the world, and when you've come to know what he said about what he's done and what he said about the future, you have a treasure that is infinitely more valuable than any other piece of knowledge or description in the universe. That this is treasure, this is pure gold that he's entrusted to you. There's a fascinating verse in 1 Peter 1 verse 12 where it says that, the prophets of old, the Old Testament prophets of old, searched for these things and saw glimpses of it. And that even angels longed to look into these things. But think about all those Old Testament greats, Abraham, David, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all those wonderful men and women of God. They saw only a glimpse of it and they were left longing for it, saying, to the Lord, to show us all of it. We want it all. We, we, we're longing for it. And it says that even the angels longed to look for these things. They wanted it and they didn't receive it mysteriously. It was reserved for us. Something special given to us. To prize, to, to treasure, to hold. And it's part of why we went through the Apostles' Creed last term as a church an overview of some of the, the vast riches of this treasure. But there, it was just surface scratchings, really. It's even deeper and more powerful still. And Jude says that these are the things that we're to defend and contend for because of how precious they are. And there are several further things that Jude highlights for us that, that makes our faith especially precious on top of what it is in itself. Firstly, he says it, it's not just a treasure for us. It's interesting that in verse 3, the word for entrusted in other Bible translations, it, it's perhaps more accurate. It says the word literally means handed down. That we've received a faith that's been handed down to us so that we might hand it down to others. The reason why any single one of us can know the depths of the riches of what Jesus has done for us and promises to us, the things that we've just been singing about as a church, is because someone in the previous generation was faithful with it and kept it and defended it and gave it to us for us to know. Passed down for us to pass down to others as well. In fact, you can, you can trace an unbroken chain from the time of Jesus and the apostles down to the present day that the flow of what's called the apostolic deposit, the main and the plane of the gospel and the Christian faith, that men and women in every single generation who had been faithful with it in their hands and passed it on to the next. It's had twists and turns, but you'll always find them, the faithful ones who kept it and guarded it and contended for it when no one else would. And we're called to play our part in this generation as well. I think one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about this is it's not just for my sake. It's not just because I, 
I'm a teacher and a preacher and a minister, but because I'm a father and because of my daughters and their generation, Jemima age three, Karen age one, and the question is, what kind of Christianity are they going to encounter when they grow up? Is it one that is so beautiful, that describes the Christ so wonderful, that they, they want to give their whole lives over to him? Is it that type of faith? that they'll encounter when they grow up? Or will it be a weak, diluted, paltry faith that makes no difference? Which kind of faith are they going to encounter when they grow up? Is it going to be someone that, that's just so identical with the world around them that they say, see no reason to follow it because they've got the world already? Or will it be a faith that contends and confronts the world and utterly transforms it. One that they're willing to give their whole lives over to bring to the world around them. Which are they going to see? Which are they going to encounter as they grow up? Jude also highlights how precious this treasure is because it's complete. He says it's, it's the faith once for all entrusted to God's holy people that and therefore, that there's no need to alter it, to change it, or to add to it. Because God's given it in fullness in Christ. It means that you can never add to its riches. And if you mess with it, you're only going to devalue it. That there's no new special revelation of the Spirit to be added to this treasure. That's just the recipe for heresy and cults, in fact that there's no special insight of the world around us that's fundamentally going to alter it, though it may help us to see it in new measures. It's a, it's a finished deposit. It's a complete treasure. Now, our call is not to add to it or to alter it, but to guard it, keep it, and contend for it. And there is, of course, nuance here. People disagree about things in the Christian faith and, and there's space for conversation, there's space for questioning, for examining the rubies and the diamonds and the valuable gems of the Christian faith in different lights and different perspectives and appreciating them more as a result. I'm not saying no to that. But in the main and the plain of it, there's clarity, there's certainty, there's universality. God is not a God of confusion. It's a finished faith that he's given to us to pass on, to treasure and to keep and to hold. Many of us last year will have watched the coronation ceremony of uh, King Charles and, and for it, the crown jewels, rarely seen together in public, in fact, were brought out. They, they were brought out of their precious protected display at the centre of the Tower of London behind. They were brought out behind from behind the bulletproof glass and behind the guard of the beef eaters, from behind the castle walls, so that he could be crowned with the same jewels and the same precious treasure that his mother had been and that her father had been before her. The orb and the, the scepter and the crown, ancient, irreplaceable, a special treasure, not to be messed with, but to be prized and protected and passed down from one generation to another. And that is what our faith is, and we're to contend for it. Well, that's the first thing that Jude highlights for us. Our, our faith is treasure. And then secondly, he, he highlights for us that we're to contend for our faith because our faith is under attack and that we're to recognise it's under attack. There are forces, there are agents at work that will try to and are trying to plunder it and deplete it. We're to be on our guard and fight against those attempts. We'll be looking a bit more about this in more greater depth next week, what this looks like for the church today. But Jude gives a really great summary for us in verse 4. He says this, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. 
The reality is that since the very first word from God's lips to us in Eden, his truth, his word has been under attack by the forces of the enemy and from the chief enemy, the father of lies. We read it, don't we, in Genesis 2 and 3, where, when God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree, any tree, apart from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what does the serpent, the enemy, twist that to in response? He asks the question, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? No, a twist, a corruption, a seeking to subvert and undermine and distort God's truth. And every, ever since then, every single precious word of revelation of truth that God has given to us, has spoken to us, has come under an attempt by the enemy to subvert, to undermine, because he hates it. He hates the truth of God. He hates the content of the Christian faith that we've just been thinking about. He hates it because it speaks of his end and Christ's victory. He hates it because it speaks of God's greater glory and his diminishment. And in every single generation, he seeks to undermine it, to distort it and deprive it to the next generation. And Jude highlights for us a primary way this occurs in the local church context the raising up and the infiltration of false prophets and teachers. We, those people who bring an alternative take on things, who encourage us to swap the treasure of the faith that was once received from what seems to be another treasure and say that this is more valuable, that this is real treasure, you get hold of this. But in doing so, you leave what's real treasure, treasure behind and you find out what, what you're offered is false and fake. It's just fool's gold and has no power. This type of attack is something that's consistently witnessed to in the scriptures in the New Testament. It's, so we're to take notice of it. It's actually found on the lips of every major New Testament author. It's found on the very lips of Jesus himself. Matthew 7, 15, he warns, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. We're so self-selecting when it comes to the words of Jesus, but we need to hear every word he says. And he repeatedly warns about this. It's on, it's on the lips of Paul. He warns the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, even from among your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw you after them. It's on the lips of Peter, 2 Peter 2 verse 1, just as there were false prophets among the people, there will be false teachers among you as well. And it's on the lips of the beloved apostle John, 1 John 2 26, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. The New Testament is just consistent in witness and warning about this, not just Jude. It's a loud witness, it's a resounding witness that we need to hear today. It's really interesting that in 2016, the, the Diocese of London issued a, a London-wide warning about the infiltration of a Korean spiritual control cult called Pau Cristo amongst some of London's biggest churches. And it was fascinating that, at that <laughs> in that season, Nicky Gumbo over at HTV, the biggest London Anglican church, to his shock, found that a number of the church's pastorates and small groups had been infiltrated by this cult. And actually, a number of the people had been deceived and started going to this cult's meetings in Canary Wharf. Stay away from Canary Wharf. And his shock behind this led him to launch, actually, and to re-emphasize the Bible in One Year project. Some of us have used that. That actually, my people have just been deceived. That they haven't spotted out what is false and what is true that these things have crept in and robbed them of the inheritance that's theirs. It can and does happen today. It can happen in this church. May it not be so. And in fact, Jesus warns us that actually it's only going to increase the closer you get to the last day, to the end times. And guess what? We're closer now today than ever. So to expect it more now than ever. This is... 
as it were, that the flip side of having a church that is so opening and so welcome to all. I, I don't want you to hear me, any, hear me say anything other than that. that if you're here and you're, you're visiting or you've not been here many times, you are so welcome. This is the place for you to belong. This is a place for you because it's God's home and your ultimate home is in him. It's for you. But the flip side of having such a place that is so open, so warm and welcoming is that anyone's allowed to be part of it, even those who are trying to deceive, even those who are trying to corrupt and subvert the truth. And the solution that Jude says here isn't to raise the drawbridge and, and to close off the church and to stop people coming into it and to reject anyone who doesn't look like us. That's not the solution, he says. He says, no, don't, don't do that. The church is not meant to be that. It's meant to be that welcoming open place. But it can only be that if it contends for the faith. If it knows it's right from it's wrong. If it can spot when things are being said, when things are rising up from the grassroots upwards, when things are being thrown at it. And says, no, that is not right. That is not true. And we're standing against it. And this is true beyond the wars of the local church as well on the larger scale, for the church nationally and internationally as well. There's a well-known prophecy that the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, issued at the turn of the 20th century, predicting the attacks that would come upon the Western church in the, in the following century. And he said this, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And the, the thing is, every single one of his predictions came true in the next century. Every single one of them. And the church so often didn't heed his voice, didn't heed his warning of these attacks that would come upon it. And as a result, lost in many quarters the treasure that had been entrusted to it and deprived the following generation of it. And we're often reaping the consequences as a result. And I want to say that the same is going on today. We'll look more next week at what some of the current attacks are but they're from multiple different angles. There are attacks on the doctrine of, of course, the finished work of the cross, the beauty of Calvary. There are attacks on the Christian understanding of human identity and the value of life. There are attacks on the uniqueness of Christ and the need for salvation. And against such attacks, we're to stand, we're to contend as a church. In the Second World War, the Battle of the Bulge, which was fought six months after the Normandy landings at D-Day in the Ardennes Forest near Luxembourg, the combined military group of the American 12th Army Group and the British 3rd Army Group, comprised of almost a million Allied soldiers, was ambushed and completely surrounded by German troops. And after days of attrition and shelling, the Germans sent a messenger to the Allied troops with a message in his hand, a really long message, a really winsome message, explaining their situation, explaining that they couldn't escape, that they couldn't get out of the mess that they're in, and saying that they should surrender to preserve their life. And this message worked its way through to the local Allied commander on the ground, an American Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, and he read the message, and he sent a single word reply to the American commander. Nuts! The American... Sorry, to the German commander. Nuts! <laughs> the American commander. A single word. Not a chance. Not a chance. We're not surrendering. We're not giving up. We are contending. You are going down. And guess what they did? 
<laughs> they contended, they fought, and actually the Germans lost. And it was the last major land battle before Berlin. It sealed their end. And I, I really want to end a sermon with a single word. But I want to say that for every single attack to the precious faith that we've been given, the treasure that's been put in our hands as a church, we have to react in, this, in the same way. I'm not giving in. I'm not surrendering. I'm not running away. Nuts. I'm fighting. I'm contending. This has been given to me to hold, not just for me, but for those ahead of me, for those entrusted on my behalf. Those treasures can be passed on to the next generation, undefiled, unpolluted, no surrender, no retreat. The enemy's not going to win. The precious faith that Jesus gave us is going to instead. Amen. Jitta so much for um, preaching with such passion. And that requires a passionate response from us. And I felt, um, as I was just praying about the response that uh, we needed to do this evening, it is not always the same in the morning, but I really felt this, this evening the Lord saying that actually there needs to be a decision made, a decision to made to stand, a decision to made that we won't give in, a decision to be made that says, I will stand for your word, Lord. And so I'm going to ask us, um, there's two ways we can respond. Um, in a moment, you're invited to either stand in your seats um, or then you can do that, but also then in the worship time, you're welcome to come and kneel at these steps and actually pray your own prayer of commitment to the Lord in standing firm. And maybe you're feeling really weak. Maybe you're feeling, I'm uncertain. This is not about having all the answers, but it is about having a willing heart. And the Holy Spirit is the one who strengthens us. Um, I've been really touched today as Jit has preached and mentioned the situation in Ukraine. Having read myself uh, this week of the situation in Ukraine where there are churches there where Christians are dying for their faith. We are blessed to have our freedom. But if we misuse that freedom, if we don't contend, we will be accountable for that. That's one of the principles in scripture. So I want us to take this response really seriously. Now, if you're not ready to stand or to come forward, that's okay. I simply ask that in your seats, you still begin to pray and say, Lord, would you take me to that place where I will stand? As I said, this is not about having all the answers. It's just about a willingness of heart. So first of all, if you feel that you want to stand at this moment, then please do. And I'm going to pray for you as you stand and say, I will contend for the faith in word, in prayer and how I live. Please stand if that's you. Father, we stand because you stood for us. We stand because you have given us the gift of life. And we simply stand in faith, Lord, and ask that you would be our teacher, that you would strengthen us, that we would contend for the fullness of the gospel. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to do that work in us that will enable us to have a resolve that keeps our eyes fixed on you. And Lord, especially for the generation here that is uh, uh, under the age of 40, I pray, Lord, and then an impartation of power to stand firm, a clarity of understanding. And Lord, we pray for a purifying of our church. Lord, would we be a people who worship you in spirit and in truth. For your glory, Lord. Amen. Please remain standing. I just need to get my phone because as we come now to a time of worship, um, as I've said, please do take the opportunity to come and kneel. Um, nobody's going to come and pray for you. It's just between you and the Lord. But sometimes the Spirit prompts us to actually be very physical in moving. But there will be opportunity also to receive prayer with our ministry team under either aisles. 
and we felt particularly tonight the Lord wanted to bring some healing to uh, legs that have been injured and just suffering with pain, to sore throats that are kind of indicative of something else going on, it might be stress, and for someone or people who've come for healing before and they haven't yet been healed, but like Jacob, it's just about persisting. Jacob said, I won't go, I won't leave this place unless you bless me. It's just about being persistent in prayer. So if any of those speak to you, please go for prayer. Um, and if there's anything else too, and in this time of worship, if you wish to come and kneel, then please do that.
behind the scenes. Actually, let's just show our appreciation to the guys up on the live stream and at the sound desk. Thank you, guys. And those who serve as coordinate. If you're visiting Holy Trinity um, and thinking of making this your church family, we would love you to please speak to the guys at the Connect banner so that we can get you uh, connected in with us. But actually, after the service this evening, James um, is meeting with some newcomers, so um, please do feel free to stay for that too. But please connect in at the, banner, at the banners at the back there. We'd love to get to know you. And starting tomorrow evening, we have our Alpha course, which we are running on a Zoom uh, link. We found that it's good for some people who can't get out in the evenings or uh, aren't accessible in it that way. But actually, this, this works just as well. So it's been really exciting to see how God moved at our last Alpha course that we did via Zoom. And our job as followers of Jesus is to be inviting people to come and take part in this. So firstly, if you're searching yourself, um, as Jitesh explained in his, uh, in his talk around uh, for himself, looking into science to find Jesus, he said he was asking the right questions within the wrong place. Well, if you've got questions, the Alpha Course is the right place and a safe place for you to ask them. So on the Zoom call, um, you'll be having a chance to chat. There'll be a, a, a short film that you'll be able to watch and discuss. And that's the link. But as Jesus followers, it's our job to be inviting other people to take part in that. And so you can sign up on the link, which you will find on our website. Or again, just speak to the guys at the Connect banner. And we have small cards. If you've still not got any, take those that you can pass on 
to your friends. But first, let's just watch a clip that will help us understand more. We're born curious. We were created to be. We ask, we question, we learn and grow. We've always been explorers, adventurers, dreamers and innovators. Asking what, how and why. And there's so much more to explore together. New stories, new adventures, new loves, new joy. We're born curious. Stay curious. Try Alpha. Wonderful. So we've come towards the end of our service. Please feel free to stay and just have a short time of fellowship. But are we fired up to ready to go out and to serve Jesus in this coming week? Are we fired up? Yes. Then leave this place to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.